we are honored to have with us finally uh, Stephen H. Hughes, and hopefully he'll explain what the H is. It's not Herbert. It's not. It's something different, and he'll. There's probably a story into that, and we'll get back to this story thing. So uh, he's tonight the keynote speaker, and um, some general information. Well, Steve is internationally renowned for his work on the roles of uh, reverse transcriptation, integration, and HIV replication, as we're about to uh, hear. So he works on many things, um, including uh, so how HIV becomes resistant to uh, reverse transcript to inhibitors, to reverse transcriptation and integration inhibitors. And he's also very interested in developing uh, drugs and uh, that are more effective uh, against uh, non-resistance mutations. Um, in terms of uh, his educa education, he started with a Bachelor of Science some time ago at the Wash U, St. Louis. He uh, got his uh, PhD at Harvard with uh, Mario Capecchi. And uh, his uh, postdoc, well, he moved with him, I suppose, to Utah. And uh, then with uh, Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus. So here's an interesting thing as I was reading this, and, and it just occurred to me, Mario and Michael and Harold, what do they have in common? They're all Nobel laureates. And where do they get their Nobel? Well, they got them after Steve Hughes went to their labs. <laughs> so if you want to get a Nobel Prize, you just get to get Steve after he retires. <laughs> three for three. All right. And um, so he spent five years at uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And then after that, um, uh, he moved, uh, uh, let's see, to uh, Frederick in all kinds of different permutations. And uh, long titles here. You can read them. And uh, finally, from 2006, 2015, he was the director of the DRP, Drug Resistance Program at the time. And um, he is still there. And uh, he's truly the, the driving force and uh, a lot of seminal work on HIV reverse transcriptase and on structural biology and then also basic uh, mechanisms of uh, function of drug resistance and over many years. And, uh, a lot of uh, his his work is uh, classical, seminal, used in courses, and then just wrote the books in, in uh, well, literally, they wrote the book, these two guys, the twins that you see here. Over the years, they have mellowed out, but they used to harass, uh, you know, how many young postdoc they, they were harassed by the tough questions, and, okay, sitting there. So, um, without, oh, there, well, there you go. Uh, among other things, he is a, uh, 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 an accomplished wordsmith, hence the term uh, Hughesism. And here's the list. I don't know if you can read it, but this is an example that some of his postdocs put together. I don't know. Here's my favorite: is uh, you can lead a horse to water, and if you sit on his head, he'll drown. Uh, if I were God, I would uh, have done things differently. And uh, there's Stephen, uh, one of his crazy moments. And uh, here's Stephen, uh, 1979, and uh, sporting a. Uh, a nice beard there, handsome. And uh, so without further ado, here's uh, uh, our distinguished speaker tonight, Stephen H. Hughes. Thank you all very much. Um, as is often the case, this is going to be a retrospective. And what I want to try and do, if I can, is to set some of the things we did both into the context of the time and into the context of why we tried to do them. And as you'll see, in some cases, we ended up doing the right thing for entirely the wrong reasons. And uh, as you'll also see, um, at least for me, luck played an enormous role in what we ended up doing and, why and, and, and what we managed to accomplish. And as I think everyone here knows, retroviruses convert their single-stranded DNA genomes into, into a linear double-stranded DNA using the viral enzyme reverse transcriptase. And that linear DNA is then inserted into the host genome by the viral enzyme integrase. And these really are the two reactions that I think perfectly characterize what retroviruses are and in many cases separate them from other kinds of viruses. And what I want to start with is not actually the science, but maybe some of the things I picked up in the sort of 40 years I've been doing uh, retrovirology. And I think probably the most important lesson, and, and actually Stefan touched on this, great matters really matter. 
And, and I was exceedingly fortunate in having really wonderful people uh, who were willing to mentor me and put up with me. And as I'll try and point out along the way, not only are great mentors important, but great colleagues and collaborators are also incredibly important. And I, I really do want to emphasize tonight um, the roles that my colleagues and collaborators have had in the things that we've done and the successes <coughs> we've had. I also want to say at the outset that what we really live for, I think, here are the epiphanies, the magic moments in which we come to understand something that really wasn't well understood before. And uh, they don't come very often, and they're hard won. So when they come, please enjoy them. I'll also emphasize, or try and emphasize, what I think is another really important rule and idea. And that is the progress in what we've accomplished, and, and by we I mean all of us, not, not just my colleagues and myself, has depended on progress in um, development of tools that have allowed us to ask questions that were simply impossible to ask a year or two or five years before. And as I mentioned already, luck helps. And in fact, you can do things the hard way, but there really is a reason they call it the hard way. <laughs> and when luck hands you something, if you can, if you recognize your opportunity, seize the day. So why did I end up, in a sense, here? How did we start out? And when I went to work for Mario, um, what we were really trying to do was to try and understand how genes worked in higher eukaryotes. I started in graduate school in 1970. This was shortly after sort of the Jacob and Minot and how genes work in bacteria. But it was obvious, both in terms of the size of the genome and, and the way things work, that, that higher eukaryotes were going to be somewhat different. And there were all sorts of, of theories, um, all of which were wrong. And um, one of the things that Mario wanted to do initially was to try and use genetics um, as a tool. And in fact, the development of cell lines that, uh, mammalian cell lines that express nonsense suppressor mutations as a way at getting at um, genetics in the same, in a way that was akin to what uh, people had done with bacteria. And, and one of the other things I want to point out here, it is true that the, the people I worked for got the Nobel Prize after I worked for them, but in every case I had essentially nothing to do with the Nobel Prize that they got. <laughs> And in Mario's case, my, my one useful contribution was to help him convince, help convince him that the things that we were doing when I was there, which was the, this hunt for uh, nonsense suppressors, was in fact not at all the right thing to do. And it got me my PhD and, and it got me a, a start in life. But um, Mario, shortly after I left the lab, turned to homologous recombination, which was a much more fruitful appro approach. So sometimes, and, and I'll mention this again in a few moments, the trick is to recognize when what you're doing isn't the right thing. And as I'll show you in a few minutes, initially at least, my postdoctoral fellowship and my postdoctoral research really had the same goal. I wanted to use retroviruses as tools to try and understand how genes worked in higher eukaryotes. And I chose to work on retroviruses as opposed to DNA tumor viruses because integration is an essential step in the life cycle of a retrovirus. And I thought at the time, which turned out to be correct, that if these things were very simple viruses and they were inserting their genomes into the host, that the inserted genome must at least pass muster as, as a, a gene-like thing. And that the rules, in fact, for expressing retroviruses ought to be quite similar to the rules for expressing normal cellular genes. And that led to the conclusion that if we were going to understand how retroviruses as genes worked, we need, to understood, we need to understand the structure of an integrated provirus. And in fact, solving the structure of the integrated provirus was my, PH, was my postdoc project. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But before I do that, I want to go through a few lessons I picked up along the way from people that were, were both incredibly kind to me and actually very valuable in terms of, of my training and understanding. And, and this is Mario Capecchi as, as he, in a sense, almost still looks. It's frightening. Um, and, and Mario was an incredibly careful experimentalist. He had golden hands. And, and he was also a very, very critical in terms of the experiments both he did and, and in fact, others did. And, and I can attest to that. And, and he, he encouraged us, in fact, insisted that we be as critical of our own data as we are of other people's. 
And um, as I mentioned earlier, he also persuaded me um, by his own actions that in fact, it's really important to know when to change your approach. But in terms of luck, I also want to mention that I first met Mario because we both opposed the war in Vietnam. And our initial meeting was when he recruited me to be a marshal in a peace march in Boston in 1970. And I didn't at the time have enough sense to recognize him as uh, one of the most important and talented sciences, scientists in my immediate orbit. And it wasn't really until I got to know him through, the, uh, through opposition to the war that I understood uh, who he was and, and why I should work for him. I'd also point out that not only was uh, Mario uh, willing to teach me how to do science, <laughs> and that was a difficult task, um, he was also the only person who's ever gotten me into white tie and tails. Um, this is Mike Bishop, and uh, after I left Mario's lab, I went uh, to work with Mike and Harold, and actually I, I made contact with them through, through Mike, not through Harold, although I ended up working closely with Harold before I left UCSF. And, and Mike had a number of remarkable gifts, but he was also probably one of, the, one of the deepest and broadest thinkers who had the best vision of sort of all the things that, were, that could Im impinge on any kind of scientific problem I've ever seen. And he was also uh, a, an in, a fabulously clear writer and, and a very good speaker. And uh, I think, in a sense, uh, trying to aspire to his writing and, and speaking is something that, that, uh, all, that I certainly have tried to do since with, with in fact, very limited success. I also had the, the privilege and the pleasure of working directly with Harold. And um, I, again, he, was a, a, he had a tremendous vision, but he was also one of the best experimentalists I ever worked with. And this is after having worked with Mario, who was truly gifted in the laboratory. But if you, if you really wanted to understand how to plan and interpret experiments, Harold was the guy to go see. And uh, he was also, a, he's a gifted speaker, but he's also a particularly good writer. For those of you who know his history, he got, before he got his MD, a master's in English literature from Harvard, uh, actually studying Beowulf. And although um, I never worked directly with, um, or never worked directly under uh, Peter Vogt, when I was a postdoc, we had a very close and careful collaboration with the Vogt lab. A and Peter's a, a, a truly fabulous biologist. And um, one of the things that, that one of the one of the things I remember most vividly from those those years was talking to Peter uh, about a problem that at the time I didn't understand and, and how clearly Peter explained it to me. And that was the problem of working on what what we knew as Sark and what eventually became Mick. And at the time um, we were studying Rouse sarcoma virus, which was the, the virus that carried Sark. And there was a separate and smaller project in the lab that was primarily being carried out by Diana Shinus. And Diana was working on a virus called MC29. And I can tell you at the time, this, the SARC project was enormously difficult because of the limited tools and reagents that we had available to us. But at least the virus was replication competent. It was a single component system. In contrast, MC29 is a defective uh, retrovirus. And um, so it's a two component system because you have the virus and the helper. And so making the tools and reagents that were necessary to study MC29 was, was even more difficult than doing the SARC experiments. And, and I, 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 for the life of me, I, this was not too long after I showed up at UCSF, and I, I couldn't, we were barely able to struggle along and do the Sark experiments, and the, the Mick experiments were just painful. And, and Diana was doing most of the hard work. I, I helped a little, but I went to Peter one day, and I said, Peter, I, 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 you guys are really smart, so I know there's a good reason you're doing this, but we're barely able to make it with the, with the Rouse virus in the, in the Sark project. Why are you working so hard on MC29? And Peter was extremely gracious and, and very carefully laid out, actually, the differences in the biology of the virus, the way the virus behaved when it uh, was put into animals, the cells that were transformed, the properties of the transformed cells in the animal, the properties of the transformed cells, the cells that were transformed, and the properties of the transformed cells in culture. And, and when he laid it out very carefully, it was obvious. And, and Peter said, well, it's clear 
if you do this comparison based on the biology, that in fact there must be very different transforming proteins involved with very different roles in the cell. And so it's important not only to have the SARC and, and understand what it's doing, but to have this other magic factor, which turned out to be MYC. And um, it, it came home to me at that time, the power of virus biology and the power of biology in virology. And, and I owe Peter a, 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 great, a great debt for being patient and explaining it to me. Eventually, after, um, after I left uh, UCSF and actually came here and then left here, I also had the pleasure of working for George Vanderwood. And, and Vanderwood was not only a great mentor, he was also a great organizer of, of groups of people to do science. I'll try and make that clear in a few minutes. But one of the things that, that, that George was really strong on and really emphasized was that, in fact, the hardest part of science really isn't the science. The science is hard, but the people are much harder. And in fact, um, even though the people are difficult, um, George was always very big on finding a way to support the people who do the good science. And, and that's very important. So I want to show a hand. Who knows who this man is? Don't lie. Ah, that is Peyton Rouse. He was born in 1879 and showed that viruses can cause cancer in 1910. And in fact, 56 years later, that was recognized as important. He got the Nobel Prize. So this is to try and set the stage for what was known before I actually showed up and started playing with retroviruses in Mike and Harold's lab in, um, in 1976. Ellerman and Bang, uh, and, and a, a little later, Peyton Rouse, showed, in fact, that viruses can cause leukemia, leukosis, and sarcomas in chickens. And so it all begins with sick chickens. Barbara McClintock, who was here, um, showed that DNA can move in the late 40s and early 50s. Howard Temin uh, proposed that the RNA can be converted into DNA. In the 60s, you heard from John some of the evidence that was accumulated that, in fact, Her uh, Howard was right. And this, of course, as John said yesterday, cul culminated in the discovery of reverse transcriptase in 1970. The organization of the Rastacomavirus genome and the identification of eSARC was done in the 70s. And retroviral polyproteins and proteolytic processing was the early 70s. And the discovery of the cellular homologs of viral oncogenes was made actually shortly before I went to Mike and Harold's lab. And again, um, by way of disclaimer, I had absolutely nothing to do with the work that won the Nobel Prize. Um, and to, to sort of come back to something I, I said at the very beginning, the technology really matters in terms of moving things forward. So the discovery of restriction enzymes about 1970 and the development of cloning in the mid-70s was to uh, actually factor very, uh, it was a very important factor in what we were able to do. We were also very fortunate that DNA sequencing was developed both um, by Wally Gilbert and his colleagues and by Fred Sanger in the 70s, and that Ed Southern developed blots in 1975, just in time to help me. And this is uh, what it was like to be at UCSF in 1978, and you can see I was the same believer in sartorial splendor then that I am now. <laughs> so if you take then the period that I was at UCSF in um, splicing, which was discovered actually here um, and, and at MIT in 77, was quickly applied to retrovi retroviruses in 78. Um, as I'll tell you in a few minutes, that we worked on the structure of unintegrated and integrated viral DNA. The culmination of that work was 78. So this was, the, this was in a sense, the 40th anniversary of that. And this, those structures were revealed here um, at the meeting in 78. That was followed very shortly by cloned retroviral DNA and by uh, early vectors in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. I'll tell you a little about that in a moment. Human retroviruses came along in 1980 and HIV in particular in 83. And I'll argue in a few minutes that uh, for those of us who do retroviruses, HIV really changed everything. 
Um, and of course, as soon as people put sequencing and planning together, we began to get sequences in the early 80s. Integrase uh, as an enzyme was discovered in 1980, and um, the integration in vitro, uh, Pat Brown experiment was 87. And again, to sort of set the stage for why some of these things could be done and, and how they were done, transfection in 78, synthetic DNA, and PCR, uh, our, our great friend PCR. So unintegrated and integrated rhizocomobias. This is Pete Schenk. Um, uh, a few of the older people in the audience may remember Pete. And Pete and I were postdocs with Mike and Harold at the same time. And we shared, in a sense, a project on uh, and elucidating the structure of unintegrated and integrated rhizocomobias DNA. And Pete was sort of the lead on doing the unintegrated, and I was the lead on doing the integrated, but we used the same tools we used the same uh, reagents, and we worked out how to do southern blots together, which wasn't actually quite as easy as you might have thought, because when Ed Southern actually published his paper, it was a little bit of a cheat in that he was doing the blot with ribosomal RNA, and there are about 100 copies, and so it's a little easier to blot that than it is stuff that's present in a single copy. And the combination of having that technology to work from and restriction enzymes allowed us to approach the problem. But of course, this is before there's any clones. So all the probes we were, in fact, the initial probes we were making were from iodinated viral RNA. And that was an unpleasant experiment if I, ever, if I was ever involved in one. But the probes we eventually used were made by using reverse transcriptase to copy viral RNA. And in fact, the five prime into the RNA, you should be able to understand the way that is made, because it's a simply strong stop. And the three prime into the RNA is made by priming with poly A and then selecting on a, uh, on, a, on a poly A column with a DT bridge. And we actually, this was, again, in the days before you could buy random primers, because it was before there was synthetic DNA, so we had to make our own random primers. In fact, this was the, the one of the first instances in which random primers were made. And we made them by smashing calf thymus DNA small and selecting things of the right size on DEA columns. And if, you, if you got a piece that was too big, it would prime itself, and if it was too small, it wouldn't prime at all. So you had to pick just the right size. And the Sarkin envelope probes, uh, for those of you who don't know the original stories from Mike and Harold, were made by selecting using deleted forms of the DNA, either a form that's missing envelope or the standard ALV precursor that's missing SORC. So you make the whole probe, and then you, repeat, you repeatedly hybridize to remove the piece you don't want, the piece that's missing in the deleted virus. And so the probes we're using in southern blots are actually made by hybridization and running things over columns in, in painful ways that, that are hard to imagine today. And um, I think everyone now knows that the viral DNA is longer than the RNA from which it's made. And sequences from both ends of the viral RNA are found on both ends of the viral DNA. These are the LTRs. And this solves a problem which was not immediately obvious when we started, which is how you get back all the genetic information in the RNA into the DNA and go a successive round and not lose anything. So this is the paper that was... Uh, describe the structure of the unintegrated linear. And at the time, what we thought was at least as important, the circular forms. And of course, we now know that the circular forms are um, uninteresting byproducts of mistaken cellular processes. At the time, of course, everyone knew that it was the 2LTR circle that was the precursor to the integrated provirus, which of course, now we all know is wrong. And there was a second paper and this is, the, this is the paper on the structure of the provirus. And by doing a fairly complicated restriction digest, which I will spare you, we were able to show not only that the provirus had the same structure, and that the ends of the linear, actually, are inserted into the genome, we could show that the restriction sites that were bounding pro different proviruses were, in fact, different, showing it's in different places in the genome. Because, of course, this is before cloning and this is before sequencing. The other thing we were interested in was endogenous proviruses. And now, again, everyone knows that endogenous proviruses arise by the infection of the germline of retroviruses. But at the time, there were some discussion and questions about whether or not some of these were actually cellular things that 
viruses came from rather than the product of viral infection. And we got at that problem by comparing the distribution of endogenous proviruses and normal genes. And the, here the probes from the normal genes are made from purified messages for those genes, which was again a painful process carried out by Farhang Pavak. And um, we showed using this that the genes were uniformly distributed uh, in, many, in many chickens, but that the endogenous viruses were in fact very variable as though they were derived by infection and not by some, that they were not ain't themselves ancient genes. So in 1979, I finished my postdoc uh, and was sort of sorry for a variety of reasons to leave UCSF and my friends and colleagues and, and the mentorship of Michael Harold, and I came here. And um, much of what we did here actually involved uh, analysis and work on cellular genes, and I'm going to skip over that because it's, uh, you all will eventually want to get to the bar, and uh, I, I promise to talk about reverse transcription and uh, integration. I really haven't hardly gotten to that so far. But one of the things we did when we were here were to develop retroviral vectors based on the rhosacomavirus. And I want to point out that rhosacomavirus, like other highly oncogenic retroviruses, are naturally occurring vectors. They're, um, they've acquired host genes, cellular genes, by uh, abstracting them from the, the genomes of the cells they infect. And rhosacomavirus, it seemed to us, had a particular advantage. It was the only naturally occurring retroviral vector that's replication competent. And as a consequence, the RCAS vectors, as we now know them, although at the time I had very much more complicated um, names, which I, I'm sure John and a few others remember, um, we, we could make that simply by removing the SARC gene and replacing it with a cDNA. And this is, in fact, um, the initial paper we published on it, which was um, a couple of years after the, uh, we first got access to a complete cloned copy of uh, Brassicomavirus. And in fact, uh, in, by 1987, we had developed the RCAS vectors in more or less their current form. And as I said, this, this is a really, a, in a sense, a very simple process. You simply remove SARC and you insert a new gene in its place. And in fact, if you actually go back and read the papers, it was a little bit more complicated than that, and I'm happy to talk about that in the bar. But conceptually, this is all that was needed. And this was an early experiment with uh, an RCAS vector. And it's an RCAS vector that expresses tyrosinase. And unfortunately, tyrosinase is a little bit uh, toxic. And so it isn't as good a marker as we initially thought it might be. If you, look at the, um, if you look at the tube over on the left, the white tube, which is uh, infected with the empty vector, you'll see that there are more cells in that tube, and that's because the, the black cells, the ones that are expressing tyrosinase, are uh, in fact partly inhibited by the, by the enzyme that we're expressing. But the point is that in terms of seeing expression without selection, I think the answer is clear. It's black and white. So. Um, I was here for about five years, and, and I had a good time here, and I had, uh, I had great colleagues here, too. But as I said, most of the work that we were doing was not directly connected with uh, integration or with um, reverse transcription, so I'll skip over that. In 1984, I was offered a position at Frederick by George Vanderwood. And in fact, um, there were no grants to write, uh, although we were rigorously reviewed every four years, and the rule was if you didn't cut it, it wasn't that you lost your grant, you lost your job. There were lots of faculty, open faculty positions to fill. And I would suggest to you, if you ever are in a position to have a chance to build a program that's already well-funded, you should take it. So one of the things that we were interested in at the time, is, and, and this came up a little bit yesterday, uh, RSV and RCAS, in mammalian cells, uh, they don't really infect efficiently. And that's because the mammalian cells lack uh, the necessary receptor protein that the viral envelope can interact with. However, even if the entry problem is circumvented, the infected mammalian cells don't produce virus. However, um, 
John Young and Paul Bates, who were then in uh, working with Herald, set about to clone the avian, uh, the re receptor for the subgroup A, avian virus, TVA. And they did it by using the RCAS vectors to select cells that had been transfected with cDNA, actually from, uh, initially from um, quail net chickens. And so they were able to clone TVA. And we recognized that if you took a mouse, and if you expressed the TVA receptor in a mouse, and you did that in a tissue-specific fashion, you would have a mouse model in which you could introduce the vector in a tissue-specific fashion. And these are the two people who, as postdocs, did that. Chris Petropoulos, because he characterized a, uh, actually an alpha-actin promoter that we had cloned from chicken and showed that it was tissue-specific in mice. And Mark Fetterspiel, who made and characterized the transgenic mice in which that alpha-actin promoter when characterized by Chris, was linked to the TVA that was cloned by Paul Bates and John Young. And this, these, are TV, these are the legs of TVA transgenic mice. That's injected with uh, heat-stable alkaline phosphatase. And the control is a mouse that doesn't make TVA. And the two other legs are legs that are from TVA transgenics. And you can see you can specifically introduce the vector and cause it to express the heat-stable alkaline phosphatase in muscle. And so this is the paper from Chris showing that the alpha-actin promoter is truly tissue-specific in, in transgenic mice. And this is the paper from Mark Fetterspiel in which the transgenic mice that are muscle infection-specific are described. And although we didn't pursue this, there was for a time a cottage industry in producing different strains of mice that expressed TVA in different tissues and allowed you to do tissue-specific infection. And uh, there was some particularly nice work uh, done on uh, tumor genesis in the brain by uh, Harold Varmason's colleagues using that kind of system. And there's now sort of a universal mouse that you can flip the, the TVA receptor on using more modern genetic tricks, which is a very nice tool. As I mentioned earlier, the discovery of HIV really changed everything. Because, the, because this was a nasty human pathogen, and the virus became the primary target. And one of the things that I think should have been obvious in the beginning, um, but may not have been, was that for the development of effective antiviral drugs, viral enzymes make good targets. And that's, in a sense, borne out by the history of the development of the various classes of drugs, the nucleoside analogs, which are RT inhibitors, non-nucleoside RT inhibitors, which come along shortly after, <coughs> followed by protease, and then more recently by integrase. And um, so now we get to the point of choosing, choosing to do HIV RT. And that's a picture sitting next to me. Uh, Eddie Arnold, who's really very talented structural biologist, and Amnon Izzy, who's in the audience, I hope. He's certainly at the meeting. And it's really actually Amnon who is responsible for getting us started on this project. Amnon had come to Frederick to work with a very talented, exceedingly talented uh, protein chemist, Steve Arousman. And um, he was going to spend the summer at Frederick, but when he went to uh, Steve's lab to, to work on he worked he went to work on a particular project. And it took, it actually only took him a couple weeks to show the project that he initially went to work on was in fact based on an artifact and that the project wasn't worth pursuing. And so relatively shortly after he arrived in Frederick, he showed up in my lab and said, I'd like to work in your lab. And, and I didn't, I'd, I'd never met him. I'd been in Frederick for a couple of three years and just getting the lab set up and there was space and I decided I would talk to him about what he wanted and I said, well, gee, I'm not, what, are you, what, are you, what are you interested in? He says, oh, I'm interested in, in retroviral enzymes. And I said, well, w w sort of, what's holding you back? Why, why don't you just study retroviral enzymes? He says, well, you just can't get enough of them. I mean, you, you, know, you grow up a little bit of virus, and even if you grow up a lot of virus, by the time you actually purify the various uh, enzymes out of them, there's, there's hardly enough to do anything with. And this was, uh, this was 87, so I said, well, well, we'll make them in coli. He says, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I said, look, Amnon, if, if you can do protein chemistry, the DNA stuff is easy. And, and it turns out that Amnon was very good at that. 
And it took him um, really only a matter of a couple of weeks to actually make expression plasmids for the integrase in RT from MLB. And he made the protease uh, expression construct as well. But it turns out that the, the protease um, was really pretty toxic to coli, at least using the relatively simple expression system we were using at the time. So we set the protease aside and we looked at the integrase in, in RT. And it was clear immediately that you were making a very, really, you could, you could see the, the band if you just broke the coli open and, and you could actually assay the enzymatic activity and, and, and just simple E. coli extracts. And we were wildly excited. And uh, George Vandewood came by and we were all sort of dancing around the lab and everything was going well. George said, you know, you guys, you know, you, you chose MLV. And she goes, well, yeah, it's a simple one. There's only, the, the, the RT is only a single subunit. It, and, and, you know, it's active, and, and, and George said, you guys really ought to think about HAV. And I said, oh, come on, George. We just got this one. It's, and we, and, and it's, they're RTs. They're all pretty similar. You know, it's, it's okay. We, we, and, and George was very polite and didn't try to push it. And I went home and I kind of thought about it. I thought, you know, HAV is a human pathogen. He's, he's really right. And so, sure enough, we sat down, and, and Amnon as I said, was really good with putting the DNA together. And um, pretty soon he had the corresponding expression constructs for the HIV enzyme. And, and the question of, of why we chose RT was essentially uh, uh, answered by the behavior of the proteins. RT was soluble, enzymatically active, and easy to work with, and the ants weren't. And, and as you, if you've talked to anybody here who's tried to work with the integrase proteins, you'll know why we set them aside. And we set about to do um, what I would call simple, simple reverse genetics, expressing the proteins in, in coli. And um, this was, Amnon did all the initial work, and that work was eventually uh, extended by Paul Boyer. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But one of the things we, we sort of recognized early, we could make milligram quantities of this stuff. We could make tens of milligrams. It wasn't hard. And, and I began to look around for, for a crystallographer to help us out with this. You know, we, we, we give you the proteins. And, and, and I knew nothing about structural biology at the, point, at the time. In fact, I still don't know very much. But um, I, I talked to sort of all the crystallographers I knew and some of them I didn't. And I couldn't give it away. And uh, I, I talked to one of my colleagues and, and, and tried to talk them into working on, on the crystallography of, of HIV reverse transcriptase. And they said to me, we have our own projects, and we think they're very interesting. <laughs> and, and I sort of slunk away and, and didn't think about it for a while. And, and eventually, uh, Eddie Arnold showed up uh, interviewing for a job, actually, at, at Frederick. And, and for a variety of reasons, he didn't take the job. But when he and I talked about reverse transcriptase, he was the only structural person I'd ever met that was wildly excited about crystallizing it. He was a brand, he wasn't even an assistant professor when I first met him. He was looking for his first job. But he was out of Michael Rossman's lab and he was really enthusiastic and he was obviously going to put his heart and soul into it. And there wasn't anybody else. So um, I gave, <laughs> and, and, and I said to Eddie, I said, how much, how much do you think you'll need to do the crystallography? And, and he says, well, maybe 10, 10 milligrams. And I thought, you know, he's young, he's enthusiastic, he's lying. And, uh, but how much can he be lying? Is he lying, you know, twofold? Or he, he can't be lying more than tenfold. Well, you know, we can make we can make fifty milligrams easy. Uh, you know, hundred is only a, you know a little more than that. So we sent him off fifty milligrams, and a couple months later, he said, "That was that was fun. How about another 50? <laughs> and and I will not try and recount for you how many grams of RT <laughs> it took to, to to get the first crystals, but it was many grams. Um, but it did work. But it was interesting, about six months after I'd arranged with Eddie and we started sending him proteins, all of a sudden I began getting phone calls from all over the United States from a variety of really very well-known crystallographers. And they all wanted RT. And, and, and I couldn't, six months before, I couldn't give it away. And finally I got a call from Dick Dickerson, the Dickerson, Dodecamer Dickerson, the, the guy whose name I really knew had written the book. And, and he wanted some RT. And I said, oh, uh, look, you know, I, I didn't suddenly get handsomer. There's a reason you guys are all calling me. He says, yeah, yeah, there's this guy, Marvin Kassman. He's at, he's at NIGMS, and 
he's called up every crystallographer in the country and he said, I'll give you money to crystallize HIV proteins. And all the crystallographers are taking the money and the honest ones are trying to find some protein. And there aren't very many people with protein and you got protein. And he says, I'll tell you what, do you have Marv's phone number? So I get Marv Kasman's phone number and I called him up. And this is the only time I've ever done this and it was the only time I think I, it will ever work. And I said to Marvin Kasman, I said, you've got money and you want people to crystallize the RT proteins. I've got RT proteins and I got no money. <laughs> will you give me some money? And he did. <laughs> and so for the next six or seven years, he funded the project. And we actually then carried out a, a sort of a parallel effort in, in structural, bio, structural biology and biochemistry. And um, both Eddie and I were really blessed in having terrific colleagues um, in this project. And, and the list is too long to try and recount for you now. But I think for a variety of reasons, there's three people I should recognize. One uh, in my lab, Paul Boyer, and um, Stefan, who's here, who worked with us for a number of years uh, when he was with Eddie, and is, is, I'm pleased to say still works with us. And Kalyan Das, who uh, was, again, a, a long-term colleague of Eddie's, who's now <coughs> gone off to, to, to start his own lab in um, Belgium. And it turns out that um, to get protein crystals to do, that diffract a high resolution, the, all the proteins need to be stacked up in the same exact conformation, the exact same way. And it turns out that RT is a little molecular machine and the subdomains move relative to each other. You've heard a little bit about that today. And as a consequence, it, it really isn't easy to stack up floppy mobile molecules in a way that diffract. They're, they're not stacked in an orderly way. And so it wasn't that hard to make the crystals, but it was impossible to make crystals to diffract. It's a meeting in Hawaii, which uh, a, a large consortium of people from, from England and from uh, Burroughs Welcome showed literally dozens and dozens of different crystal forms, none of which diffracted to, to less than eight angstroms. And Tom Stites, who was the other person to succeed in the initial attempts to get the RT crystals, used a non-nucleoside inhibitor, which also froze RT in, in a single configuration. And what we eventually ended up doing was using a combination of a DNA substrate that the, that the RT could grip, and that would help hold the subdomains in a particular configuration. And we also used an FAB, and you heard earlier today that FABs can sometimes be helpful in uh, getting things to hold still. And so um, by 1993, we had a high resolution structure, a structure of three angstroms. And right about the time this was, we were getting ready to publish this, I had lunch with Eddie Arnold and, and Marv Kasman. And it was a crummy little Mexican restaurant in Bethesda after the NIGMS <coughs> structure meeting. And eating you know, really inferior Mexican food, but drinking lots of, lots of uh, big sloppy margaritas. And finally, Marv looked over at Eddie and I and he said, this was sort of like four or five years after we first started getting, trying to get crystals. He says, I don't understand why you guys didn't quit. I said, my God, Marv, you were paying for it. <laughs> I said, you know, you were supplying really a fair amount of money. You were you know, you're paying for three or four people in each of the labs. Uh, how could we not work hard on a project if you were willing to fund it? And he said, well, Guys, you were <laughs> you guys were working day and night, all of you. The least I could do was pay for it. And I said, "Gee, Marv, I'm awfully glad we hadn't had lunch before." <laughs> so, so part of the trick is be careful when you have lunch with the guy that's paying for things. <laughs> so this is actually um, a very simple ribbon diagram of of RT. Uh, you've all seen this, I'm sure. This is the P51 subunit. This is P66 RNSH, the connection domain, the thumb, the fingers. This is the strand that's being synthesized. This is the strand that's being copied. And this is basically the original study from the 1993 paper. And one of the reasons that we thought this was important was that um, one of the things that, that plagues the development of antiviral drugs in general and anti-HIV drugs in particular is a development of resistance. So you want to try, if you can, to develop drugs that are relatively resistant to developing resistance. And um, we, th we thought, and I still think, that if you understand how resistance arises, 
we may be able to develop drugs that can get around the problem. So these are the HIV inhibitors. That's the binding site for nucleosides, and that's the binding site for non-nucleosides. And the nucleosides include a number of familiar, and as do the non-nucleosides, a number of familiar drugs that are used clinically to this day. And uh, a little digression on, on nucleoside analog resistance. At least the nucleoside analogs that are approved clinically, there's some hope now actually for, for developing ones that actually have a 3 prime hydroxyl. But the ones that are approved for clin clinical use are missing the 3 prime hydroxyl. And if they're incorporated into viral DNA, they block additional DNA synthesis. And resistance implies in some sense that the mutant form of RT has an enhanced ability to discriminate between the normal triphosphate and the analog. Because, of course, you can't evade the job of carrying out reverse transcription. You have to be able to put the viral DNA together. So you have to be able to discriminate. And the discrimination can take place at the time the analog is being incorporated. That's exclusion. Or it can actually happen after the analog has been incorporated and if the enzyme has develops a way to cut it out, excision. And in fact, HIV uses both. 3TC and FTC, resistance is by exclusion. And AZT, resistance is by excision. So this is a, a paper, one of Stefan's nice papers, showing, in fact, structurally, that 3TC resistance is due to steric hindrance. In fact, a beta-branched amino acid can make contact with the larger oxyphylline ring of 3TC or FTC. And it's much harder then to incorporate it relative to the normal triphosphate. And this is a corresponding biochemical paper that we did afterwards to show that, in fact, everything that Stefan predicted based on the structural analysis was, in fact, true biochemically. In contrast, AZT resistance involves pyrophosphorolysis. And in fact, it involves the removal of the AZT MP after it's been incorporated into the end of the viral DNA. And the way it actually happens is the pyrophosphorolysis was carried out by not pyrophosphate, but ATP. And so the, pro the product is AZT tetraphosphate A. And of course, more importantly, a free viral DNA N. And in fact, the story begins with work from Mike Porniak and, and Walter Scott. Uh, Mike Porniak pr pr uh, first proposed pyrophosphorolysis, but he predicted that it was pyrophosphate that was going to, in fact, excise AZT. And I will argue, although not now, that that is a violation of uh, microscopic reversibility and that you can't use pyrophosphate. And Walter Scott made what I think was really the, the, the sort of the seminal contribution here. And he realized that, in fact, if the pyrophosphate donor was ATP, that you would be able to preferentially excise as opposed to reincorporate. Whoops, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. And um, it turns out that wild type AZT, I'm sorry, wild type RT can excise AZTMP weakly using ATP as a substrate. And what we, sh what we did was to connect the roles of the different resistance mutations to the ability to carry out AZT excision. And it turns out that the, the two really most important mutations, one is uh, T215 to either Y or F, that actually, that putting the, the large aromatic group actually stacks on the adenine of ATP and creates an ATP binding site. And similarly, the K70R mutation, the R is able to interact both with the ribose ring and with the first phosphate of ATP. And I'm happy to go through this in as much detail as people want, but not now. And um, this is the first paper that in which we developed a model of this. And uh, the model is done uh, by Stefan and the biochemistry done by Paul Boyer. And this is actually a paper that has the crystal structure of both the 
resistant and the wild type reverse transcriptase bound to the excision product AZT tetraphosphate A. And I recommend it to you. There was an interlude in 1997. It was actually an interlude of more than a year in which I was involved with some great colleagues in developing the retroviruses book. The reason that the book is good is not my involvement, but the fact that if you look at the list of authors, it's, uh, it's a really stellar list. And that in addition to having the pleasure of working again with Harold Vermis, I had the pleasure of, of working extensively on this project with John Coffin. Now to go briefly and quickly to integrase integration, here uh, you see Steve Smith, who's in the audience, I think, who is in my lab. Terry Burke, who's a very talented, uh, a very talented chemist, who works with his colleague uh, uh, Joshi Zwe, and uh, Peter Cherapanov, who's done the crystallography of some of Terry's compounds with um, PFD integrase, and Yves Pamier, who's done biochemistry, uh, again, with some of the compounds that Terry and his colleagues have um, developed. And I'm not going to talk very much about our efforts to develop the inhibitors, but I did want to tell you one brief anecdote. And I tell it to you because it's connected in an odd way to a, to a story you've heard actually from Celia Schiffer in a very different context. So this is a, a model that's developed from one of Peter's crystal structures. And viral DNA is shown here in green. And uh, target DNA is shown here in blue. And one of Terry's compounds is bound here in gold. And it may be a little hard for you to see in this particular image from the cover of the journal. But it turns out that the inhibitor fits almost perfectly within an envelope that's defined by the juxtaposition of the viral DNA and the host DNA target. And the reason that this is reminiscent of what um, Celia showed was that, in fact, this is, a, this is a compound that is very difficult for the enzyme to develop resistance to. And as Celia pointed out, and her colleagues pointed out some years ago with protease inhibitors, if the inhibitor fits entirely within the substrate envelope, it's sort of hard for the enzyme to figure out a way to reach in and reject the inhibitor. And that turns out to be as good a model in integrase, although it took us a while to figure it out, as it is for protease. And I would say that uh, the other really effective compounds like dolutegravir actually fit within this model. And this has become a guiding force in the design of compounds. And one of the reasons I'm not going to talk any more about um, integrase and integrase inhibitors, you're going to hear a great deal more about this in a couple of days from somebody who knows more about it than me. So. This is a little vignette um, that, in a sense, shows a, a sort of an odd connection between uh, what I would call basic science and what eventually becomes a, something clinically interesting. This is Jung, Jung Suk uh, Oh, who was a postdoc in the lab. And this is work that was initially done with Russell Cumbavirus. And what Jung, Jung Suk did was to make mutations in the genome of actually the RCAS vectors so that you would get an end that was not a good substrate for integrase. And if you set it up so that you, you make a DNA with one bad end, we wanted to see what would happen. And rather to my astonishment, in some cases, the titers were pretty high, like 20 or 30 percent of the, the unmodified enzymes. I'm sorry, the unmodified genomes. And the reason that's odd is because, in fact, only one of those two ends goes in by integrase. And the other gets stuffed in by host processes. And I was pretty sure that the host would clean out this extra piece of, of DNA that's sort of stuck in by one end. But that's not what happens. And in fact, when the host does that, you get all kinds of weird aberrant integrations. You get duplications of the host. You get deletions of the virus. You get duplications of the virus. You can even bring in pieces from other chromosomes. And so you get very weird bits at the, at the sort of awkward end of the viral DNA. And at first, we thought this was just some interesting piece of phenomenology. Now this is one of this, this. These are a couple of papers that uh, Young Suk published on this, showing that you could, in fact, uh, it didn't matter. You could mess up either end, and you'd get the same thing. It wasn't end specific. But we then actually began to wonder whether, in fact, you could get the same sort of thing if you blocked one end of integration with, in fact, integrase inhibitors. 
And this, these were experiments done by, by, by Jan. And they were done with HIV. And it turns out that suboptimal concentrations of integrase inhibitors cause exactly the same kinds of weird aberrant integrations because they block one end of the integration event. And in addition, it turns out, if you simply make the integrase weak by having it be inefficient, you can also get the same kinds of integrase, uh, I'm sorry, aberrant integrations. And, and we actually think that that's something that people should pay attention to because we think it's possible that aberrant integrations uh, might actually have clinical consequences. So one last little story, and, and then, we'll, then we'll move on. And, and this is a story of actually chasing integrase, I'm sorry, integration sites in patients. And by way of introduction, I want to say, um, this, is, this is sort of an, uh, an act of faith on my part, but my colleague Mary Kearney actually has uh, very good data, and, and so does Frank Maldarelli to back me up. I'm going to say flat out that ongoing viral replication doesn't explain the persistence of the virus in patients on successful long-term antiretroviral therapy. In fact, HIV persists, as you, as you know, because it integrates a copy of its genome in many places in the host genome. And the integrated viral DNA persists as long as the infected cells survive. However, in most infected patients uh, that are on treatment, most, but not all, of the integrated viral DNAs are defective. The infected cells, as we and others showed a couple years ago, can clonally expand. In a clone of infected cells, obviously all the proviruses are present in the same site. And in fact, that's how we trace clonal expansion. And this is Frank Maldarelli, who's sitting over here in the audience. And this is um, a paper we published that shows that there are specific HIV integration sites that are actually directly linked to clonal expansion. And one of the reasons for showing that here is it's actually reminiscent of a bit of an old phenomenology in which the integration of tumor viruses next to oncogenes can cause clonal expansion. And so these are data from um, patient integrations. And we looked at the clones of expanded cells, and we looked to see which genes were, in fact, the ones for which they were large clones. And we noticed that the MKL2 gene, there was a clone here in which we isolated the same integration site 48 times. There's another clone 22 times. And so there, here, here's five separate big clones that all have integrations in the MKL2 gene. And this is the MKL2 gene. Here's the start of transcription over here. Here's the start of translation. Here's the end of the gene. And here are all the clones in the gene from one of the patients. And in fact, down here, this little region here has been expanded. So here's intron four, five, and six. And all of these are integrations from a patient. And the ones that are circled here are ones that we know are from expanded clones. And in fact, I'll tell you, I deeply believe they're all from expanded clones. And so I'm going to posit that this is not the result of specific or selective integration in one part of the gene, and particularly not in one orientation, but in fact as the result of selection because these integrations drove the clonal expansion of the cells that carried these particular proviruses. And by way of evidence that in fact that is true, this is a surrogate for the initial distribution of the integration sites made by infecting PBMCs in culture and harvesting those cells very rapidly and then doing the integration sites. And here you can see there's a pretty uniform distribution. It slightly favors the five prime end of the gene, as you would expect from if you pay close attention to where HIV goes. But more importantly, the, now the orientation of the virus is about 50-50 in both orientations. So this is selection. It's not selective integration. So what do we learn from the analysis of integration sites in HIV-infected people? We know now that HIV-infected cells can clonally expand in the first few weeks after a person's infected with HIV. I haven't showed you that data, but we have it. It's published um, that clones can persist for more than 10 years. That's in the, the, that's in the Maldarelli paper. 
We know that clones can carry infectious proviruses and release infectious proviruses into the blood. That's from uh, Francesco Simonetti, who was a very gifted person working in Frank's lab. We know that only a fraction of the infected cells that are in clones, including the clone that carries the infectious provirus, actually express viral RNA at any one time. This is presumably the reason that the clones can expand and persist, even though they carry infectious proviruses, because in most cases, the provirus is silent and doesn't reveal itself. We know that uh, clones of infected cells can comprise uh, multiple T cell subsets. That's work from that we did with uh, uh, Danny Duick and Eli Boritz. I showed you the data that MKL2 integrations can drive clonal expansion. There's equivalent work that I won't tell that I will tell you, but not show you. But that's also true for integrations in BAC2. However, um, despite the fact that there are cases in which there are integrations that will drive clonal expansion, we now believe, and it's based on, the, on, a, on a numeric argument, that in fact most clones persist because of homeostatic signaling and our antigen stimulation, not because of where the provirus is integrated. And uh, working with Jeff Lipson and his colleagues, we've shown now that there's a, we have a promising SIV macaque model. The overall pattern of integrations is similar. There's extensive clonal expansion of animals that are infected with SIV and then put on long-term art. And so I'm going to close with sort of a, a little bit of politics here. I'm going to argue that science is an effective way to understand the world and the universe around us when there are no alternative facts. We're supposed to report objectively on what we see and learn. Our hypothesis and conclusions should rest on solidly on our data, and we should not try and reshape the data to fit our favorite hypotheses. Science is a human endeavor. It's not limited by national borders, nor do scientists belong to one gender, one race, one religion, or one sexual orientation. And I don't say this because I think you don't know it, but because I'm afraid some of our colleagues who are outside the world of science don't know it. And this is supposed to be a gesture of solidarity between me and you. And so I will say that there's probably no greater honor that can come to anyone than the respect of their colleagues. And so I thank you very much for the honor of being asked to speak to you tonight. And um, if you're willing, I'll answer questions. Those insertions into BOT2 and MKL2, yep. those, those look like enhancer insertions? I don't think we know. Um, and let me go and back. Are, the, are the LTRs let me go have back. any modifications? Um, let me go back, and then I'll explain to you why we don't know as much as I would like. Um, in this particular case, remember we're in the middle of a gene, right? The ones in BOT2 are just upstream of coding, it turns out, just upstream of the APG. These guys are down about halfway through the coding. They're in between two coding exons. And um, Frank and his colleagues are busily characterizing the proviruses, and, and that is not a complete story, and, and you should talk to Frank for the details. So far, all the proviruses that are there are highly defective. My guess in this case is that we're probably looking at um, a, either a promoter insertion and, and, or, and or, as John has suggested, actually a terminator insertion, which is also possible. Um, in BAC2, I think it's more likely that it's, um, that it's a promoter insertion. And there is actually an MLV model from um, uh, Finsco Peterson uh, in which there's BAC2 driven by MLV insertions. Um, we're in the process of trying to recreate these guys in culture to study the RNA and the products. But I'll point out that these cells are in the material we get from the humans, about one cell in 100,000. And so doing the sorts of things that we would like to do, th these are not like tumors, of course. These are, these are occasional cells in this bulk of stuff out of the blood. 
And so we can't look at RNA, we can't look at the nature of the promoter in the stuff out of the patients easily. Uh, although we would sure like to. How much is known about suboptimal integrated transplant inhibitor uh, concentrations administered to patients and adverse effects that that has in patients? Um, essentially nothing. Um, the only thing we've been able to do is to show that in tissue culture systems, and um, this does include doing experiments in both primary cells and in uh, cell lines, that you can relatively easily generate really weird looking proviruses by doing that. Um, you can't use the kind of technology we use here to pull out integration sites to pull out the aberrant ones because of the way the PCR works to pull out the aberrant ones. Um, uh, if we could think of an easy way to do that, we would. I've thought a little bit about doing that in the monkey model and there are maybe ways of doing it, but it isn't easy. Um, I think the, the thing to do, and, and it's actually relevant to this project as well, is to, is to look for bad things in, in the patients because there are certainly patients on, inadvertently on suboptimal concentrations. And by suboptimal, I can actually mean two things and, and we've showed that both are true. Even an optimal concentration normally becomes suboptimal if you have a resistant mutant. And so what would otherwise be optimal is suboptimal when you get resistance. And because the, some of the resistance mutations make the virus unfit, even in the absence of any drugs, you can get aberrant integration. And the question is, the real question is, the degree to which aberrant integrations, given that these are, quote, normal integrations, uh, at least we think, uh, although the proviruses are deleted, the degree to which Aberrant, pro aberrant integrations are substantially worse in terms of their consequences than, than sort of normal integrations. That isn't known. But we're, we're, the experiment is underway, for better or worse. <coughs> you were telling us about the, the <coughs> viruses um, <coughs> are mostly damaged after integration, they're inactive. Is they're not damaged after integration. They're, they're almost certainly, at least the ones Frank's looked at so far, with one interesting exception, which you can talk to Frank about, which is a solo LPR. They're damaged during reverse transcription, during reverse transcription. and integrated normally. But the way we're pulling <coughs> the integrates, the, the way we identify integration sites, we won't get the ones that are, if there are aberrant ones, we won't get them. So is this apobec damage? No, 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 these are, these are well, there are apobec damage ones, but the damage I'm talking about are deletions for the most part. The number is the apobec. Yeah, well, you do, but, but the point is if there, if there was one with a bad end, we wouldn't get it. And, and is there any enrichment for those in the latent reservoir? It's the, the, the latent reservoir sort of by definition is in a sense alive. The ones you worry about anyway are alive. There's certainly enrichment for dead ones in patients on therapy. And, and the work of Bob Silicato, among others, has showed that if you're on therapy for a long period of time, maybe 95, 98% of the proviruses are dead. And there are probable reasons for selection for dead guys. Um, although it's not a sufficiently strong selection to get rid of all the live guys, because some of the live guys duck. And uh, Mary is working, Mary Kearney is working very hard to try and understand the, the relative proportion of proviruses that are dead, in a, a clones with a dead provirus that express, as opposed to clones with intact infectious proviruses that express. And I'm, there are hints that it might be different, but I'm not yet persuaded that it's different. And we can talk about why that's true if you wish. So Steve, you mentioned um, in an earlier slide that where the integration occurs is not important in your opinion as much as, well, you mentioned a couple of different things. Do you want to elaborate a little bit? Um, this is a prejudice, so 
But we did do, we did do, and, and John and I have sort of talked for, what, two years now about redoing the experiment more cleverly. And one of the things I didn't talk about is uh, a technology that, um, that I was inspired by Eric Poshler, who's here, uh, which is to, to redirect HIV integrations to other parts of the, of the human genome other than where it normally would go. And we did experiments in which we sent, deliberately sent HIV to what I would call bad neighborhoods. So HIV normally goes into the bodies of highly expressed genes in gene-rich regions. This is, I mean, we repeated it, but it wasn't initially our work. But we did send HIV proviruses to places um, which are mostly off, which you can do with, uh, by making WEDGEF fusion. And uh, when you do that, at least in a relatively, uh, in a relatively preliminary experiment, you get just about as good at expression in the short term if you send them to bad neighborhoods as you send them to where they normally go. So, and, and you also have to remember that, at least in the case of HIV, if the patient is not on therapy, the lifespan of an infected cell, if it's a cell that's going to make, make something, is a couple of days. So you really only have to think about how the virus is going to behave for a couple of days. And certainly under those circumstances, HIV, at least in our hands, is about as well expressed in a bad neighborhood as a good one. And I think actually, if you think about what HIV wants to do, it wants to be expressed no matter where it lands. So it carries all the stuff it needs to be workable wherever it goes. Now, it may be in terms of the stuff that hangs around for a very long time, that some may be more silenced than others, and that's one of the things that <coughs> ought to be looked at. But I don't think in the short term it makes much difference. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> Anybody? All right. Well, let's thank Steve for a wonderful talk. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Outstanding.